Can you talk more about uh, the residual in specific pesticides? And it, it seems like some growers have been surprised that their uh, the test results are coming back as having contamination from pesticides when they weren't even using those pesticides. So talk about some of those surprises and and why that's occurring. The Mostly, when it comes to when it comes to growers who get surprised that their their product was dirty, a lot of them are surprised that it's dirty because they sprayed it early in its cycle, and so they're surprised that it didn't go away. It's it's typically not pesticides that you see move downstream. It's fungicides, and fungicides' reason being is that indoor cultivation doesn't really generate UV ultraviolet. And ultraviolet is what's needed to break down some of these fungicides into a more inert form. And so when you, when you apply something like Eagle 20 microbutrinol to an indoor grow in any capacity, meaning your mom ops are always indoor, um, all of these situations um, we found create a reserve of maybe up to five to seven years to where the, the, the facility itself is contaminated, meaning that there's particulate of microbutrinol present in the space and pieces of it break off and land on your cannabis. And so rooms that were used prior that were, haven't been used in years are coming up hot. And so any of these facilities that were priorly used, they're, they're registering hot because there's contamination that won't break down. For most of the growers that are coming up with problems now in concentrate form, which is really where you see it, it's almost you know 68% of the issues microbutrinol. And, and, and I would say probably at least 40% of it's coming from the mothers. So what you have is you have this incredible quantity of nurseries that are using tools to give a stellar appearance, but that product cannot be used in the concentrate industry. And so what we know as a nursery is that I get orders all the time to fill clients who have bought products that have then blown dirty. And they can even test the clone, and a clone will not detect any levels so you can't test the mom or test the clone it won't come up in veg you have to literally take that product and make it into a super concentrate and, and accentuate it and then you'll know if you can use it or not and it makes it really difficult because it's when you ever you receive any clonal stock you have to actually find out you know hey how has the mom's been treated and who honestly wants to tell you hey they cheated on the job Right, or if even you're saying even if they tested the clone and it turned out, but the producer clean. would know. The producer would know. See, the bottom line is if the producers move in stock that's dirty, how do they get fooled? They're the producer. So if you're producing the material, there's no way you didn't know what was the input material. And and for us, we're licensed through the Department of Ag for spray, meaning that I, we have a spray license. This is a you know I have a degree in nursery practice. This is like actual nursery, and. What it does is it, it lets us have a very, now we're running all organic spray methodologies, but every single thing we use is documented and given to the ag department monthly. So everything we use, how much we use, what spray grids, what intensities, what patterns, what we used it for. I mean, an entire a, a program is created to monitor all of this. There's no way you're, you're, you're not aware of what you're doing. And everyone says, well, a worker did it. Well. What worker is so inclined to, to kill the business's money without direction from the leadership? And so what I know is that people who pick up stock, and, and a way that a nursery could make the stake is they get clonal material from someone to start the mother process. That's a tough one because you basically have to almost grow the plant that came out, flower some of it, blow it, test it. If it's a zero, you can run it. You see the pro like it's an extremely time-consuming process. That's why so much of the stock that I sift in clonal form is really out of seed. So I sift clones, but I get them from people like me that are organically based, meaning living soil, uh, biological predation. So this way, what we know is that the material used by me or anybody else like me is shareable. But if it's coming from strangers, I have no idea what it is. And so basically, I have to run it and then blow some of it to see, blow mean and turn it into a concentrate, to see is it clean source. But if I go from seed, 
then I can get around that. But the public doesn't want C. They don't want differentiation. They want very similar products. Otherwise, Nike wouldn't be Nike. It'd be sneakers. But it's Nike. So people want Nike. And, and in the market, you have to understand that. And that's where seed becomes difficult because seed lets us sift for progeny, pulls out phenotype, but it doesn't allow us a stability yet. And so for a lot of individuals, you know, you got to make sure you understand where you're gathering the source stock from and where you're producing it. And if you're inheriting old buildings, were they used previously? And if these buildings were used previously, we, it gets into another problem is now you have this where broad and russet might slide because there used to be broad and russet might that came from all the other agricultural industries prior. Any nursery is going to have them. And then now you have an incredible concentration of uh, russet mite being applied to humble, trinity, mendo, all for uh, species eradication of uh, star thistle. So they've used uh, a mite control in Canada for decades, and now they're using it heavily in our area to control you know, these, these uh, unnatural uh, plants, what they call them invasive species. But the problem is it's, it's, it'd be like if you went and sprayed for invasive species in Napa and you shot out the, you know, the, the lacewing or, the, or the, the grape borer or whatever the n nasty pathogen is for grape, that's basically what happened for us here. And so the russet mite became such a massive issue because it holds dormant well. And when it comes out, it's unlike anything anybody's seen. No one knew how to identify it. And because it's microscopic in size, you can't see it, it moves too fast. And if you can't ID the damage or the silicone nodule egg layment, then you really can't pinpoint what it is. But what we found with um, russet mite is really in vegetative form, the sulfur works fantastic. So either micronized sulfur is dry or, or, or wettable sulfur sprayed wet, and it absolutely tears these things up. And as long as we can spray them out, we can control. And then what we did for flour is where you can't use sulfur is you get into biological predation. And bi biological predation is get a hold of your bug dealer, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna work out a strategy of what bugs to use, and they're gonna be combinations of juveniles and adults so that juveniles can hatch over a 20, 30 day period and come out sequentially, and the adults are already pre-starved. And so when I, I had russet mites at my farm this year, and so we, 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 they blew in, they must have blown over a mountain because I don't have any farms around me. So they windborne, they can move for miles, and they landed on the bench, and we saw some pirate bugs, and pirate bugs typically let you know you have other bugs that are being eaten by the pirate bugs because they don't you, just colonize. What's an example of a pirate bug? They're yellow with a little black dot on them. So they just name little pirate bugs, but they're, they're, it's just like if you have ladybugs all over the place, odds are there must be aphids somewhere. So when you, when you look at predators, if you have a lot of wolves in your neighborhood, you probably have some deer. You have a lot of beer, you probably have trash. There's, they're going after something. And so predators let us find prey easier than we see prey because predators are always bigger. So predators let us see on bugs. We can see the thing we're looking for, and then we can say, okay, that's a sign. And so my, my farm guys, uh, Spence, located the, the, the pirates. We did the ID, found the russet. And what we did was an aggressive biological attack on it, where we went at three times the normal pressure. So if it was to add, you know, 1,000 sachets, we went up to 3,000 sachets. And what it did was it allowed me this incredible ability to actually outfight the, the infestation. So as the infestation was increasing, I was, I was running at a much higher level of predation. So literally, I just blasted them right out. So I might have only lost, you know, maybe 3% of the total to russet damage. And I would have lost, you know, 40%. So the, we're talking radical differences, and we're not talking huge money. A normal application of bugs for me would be about thirty-five hundred. It cost me ten grand to absolutely seal it. And if I had realized it, and, and I should have, and what do I know from this lesson? That next year when I put the plants out, we just lay out all the beneficial sachets with the crop the whole time, and that way the release is just continuous, and we just know that russets will come back, and that's how it is. But as we control the vegetative plants with sulfur so that we're not having any issues, we get them into the garden, organically boost them up so that they're healthy, add the predation, and now we have a biological balance. And so that it's, it's not the issue that people thought it was, but, but it is when you don't know how to control it. And most people misdiagnose it terribly because they see the browning of the pistils and they think that the plant is prematurely flowering. They don't realize that it's just straight dying. 
and because they're misdiagnosing it, they don't have the ability to actively fight it. By the time they really realize what they have, basically it's like having stage four cancer. There's not much you can do at this point. It's, it's aggressive. So if you have to catch it when it's stage one, you gotta get the freckle when it's misshapen, not, not when it's a giant tumor the size of a, a grapefruit. And I don't think people are familiar enough with the real cultivation practices of this type of thing because we're all learning really new predation, meaning what do we use? New pests, new pathogens, what are the things we're fighting? And new tools, what can, we, what can and can't we use? So new and new and new creates problems, but it, it, it's workable.